Friday, September 1st. My last class of the day is Language Arts with Mrs. Bridges. If you think we're slugs in the morning with Ms. Alvarez, you should see us by six period. Some kids actually fall asleep, but I don't think they're completely to blame. By the time we get to six period, the portable's air conditioners have been struggling along for seven hours with the doors constantly opening and closing. We're sweating buckets by then. We're wilting. Even Mrs. Bridges' perm is wilting by then. But today, when the speaker crackled and the gong bell sounded, I was filled with new energy. I hefted up my gym bag and set off for the soccer tryouts. Just to the south of the portables is a, ba is a baseball diamond with a scoreboard that says Lake Windsor Middle School, home of the Seagulls. The soccer field is to the left of that, next to a stretch of undeveloped land. As I left the wooden walkways, Jilly fell into step with me and we jogged together to the fields. You're a pretty good goalie, right? He asked me. Right, I said. Well, then I'm going out for fullback. Hey, we, we need at least two, two goalies. What, what if I get killed? You're not going to get killed. I'll play fullback. I like fullback. You get to knock people down. Suit yourself. Joey pointed to a circle of kids near the sideline. Check out Tommy over there, the kid with the ball. He's from the Philippines. Awesome display, man. Awesome. I looked over and recognized a kid from my home war, homeroom, Tommy Acoso. He had a group of guys standing around watching him like he was a juggler. We stopped to watch him too. He kept hitting the ball straight up in the air with his head, feet, and knees, never letting it touch the ground, just keeping it going and going and going. Sometimes he would make it stop dead right on his forehead. It was an awesome display. Not all of these guys were the toe stubbers who I played with last week. That's Gino over there, Joey whispered. Gino DeLuca. He'll be captain this year, no doubt. He was co-captain last year, scored 22 goals. I saw a big guy, big for a soccer player, with long curly black hair. He was driving penalty kicks into the net from 12 yards out. I asked Joey, where's he from? I don't know, New Jersey, I think? Gino kept hammering penalty shots into the upper left corner of the goal while a tall kid in a gray sweatshirt retrieved the ball and rolled it back. Gino is obviously a major leaguer. He's the kind of guy you have to have on a soccer team in order to win. The guy who wants to take the penalty kicks. The guy who's hungry to score some goals. The head coach is Coach, coach Walski, an eighth grade teacher. He blew a whistle and we all moved toward him. He looks more like a baseball, basketball guy to me, but he coached the soccer team last season and he knows most of the 7th and 8th graders. He's tall and nearly bald. When he spoke, it was in a raspy voice. I want to congratulate you guys on making the team. There was a scattering of laughter. For those of you who may not know it, our policy in the Lake Windsor Middle School soccer program is this. Everybody makes the team, everybody practices, everybody gets a uniform. However, and he paused here for emphasis, that does not mean that everybody is, as we say, on the bus. Everybody cannot, and I must emphasize, cannot go to every away game. We have a small team bus and we have restrictions due to insurance. We can only take 15 kids to the away games. That's our policy. You're a part of this team from day one, but your part may be to play in practice games only and to dress for the home games only. Does everybody understand? There were nods around the group. The coach continued. Okay. Let's get started. Gino, you're the captain. Take them, take them twice around the field, then we're going to break into sixth, seventh, and eighth grade groups and start calisthenics. Let's move out. I ran with Joey and about 30 other guys twice around the field. That means half of us are dog meat, Joey muttered. What are you complaining about? You're on the team. 15 kids are on the real team and 15 kids are dog meat. I was dog meat last year and it was a drag. I don't want to do that again. Hey, it makes sense to me. Why drive all these extra guys to a game when there's no chance they're going to play? Yeah, 
That's easy for you to say. Joey pointed. Oh, sorry about that. Uh-oh. Oh, my goodness. After calisthenics, there we are, we broke into groups to kick the ball around. I had no reason to do that, so I found my gym bag and got out my goggles and knee pads and elbow pads. Gino and some other eighth graders were back at the goal, kicking shots at the guy at the kid in the gray sweatshirt. I walked up next to the goal and stood there until they couldn't help but notice me. The kid in gray checked out my goggles and said, yeah, it came from Mars. The eighth graders laughed, but when I didn't go away, Gino said to me, you here to play or are you here to model sportswear? To play. Gino motioned and the kid in the gray sweatshirt stood off to the side. I moved into the goal dead in the center and placed my heels on the chalk line. A kid with red hair was next in line to kick. He took a shot that rolled wide of the goal. I never even moved. I was waiting for Gino and he knew it. He called for the ball and then placed it with care on the penalty line. He stepped back three paces and looked right at me. I got down into my goalie crouch, a coiled spring ready to release. Gino shouted like a samurai, took two quick steps and started his powerful kick. I sprang up and to my right, exactly where I had watched him kick every other penalty shot. I heard the sound of his foot walloping the ball and then I felt it smack against my right wrist. The ball flew away from the goal as fast as it had flown and it sailed toward the far sideline. I hit the ground and popped up immediately, ready for more. Gino looked at the ball bouncing away in the distance and then looked back at me. He seemed genuinely surprised. Whoa, he said quietly and gave me a thumbs up sign with both hands. The kid in the gray sweatshirt hung around by the goal for another minute, then he casually walked out and joined the others in line, waiting for a turn to kick one at me. The coach didn't see any of this, but I knew I had just landed the job. I was now the Lake Windsor Middle School goaltender, first string goaltender, on the bus goaltender, Tuesday, September 5th. Mom and I had just returned home from the supermarket. We were unloading her station wagon, carrying bags of groceries from the garage into the kitchen, when Eric and Arthur pulled up in the Land Cruiser. There was mud splattered all over the sides, all over the tinted windows, and even up on that center spotlight. Eric got out of the passenger side and walked up to Mom slowly and solemnly. Arthur got out and followed him. Eric stopped just inside the garage and said, Mike Costello is dead, Mom. He got killed at practice today. Mom and I stopped still, the supermarket bags weighing down on our arms. Neither of us moved or, or knew what to do next. We stared at him speechless until he continued in the same voice. He was just standing there in the end zone. He had one hand on the goal post, leaning on it, and kaboom! There was a crack and a flash and, and he went flying through the air. He landed right on his back, right there on the goal line. By now, mom was staring at him hard, trying to understand the point of his speech. Eric, the, the boy, the, the boy who was here, Mike, is dead? Dead before he hit the ground, Arthur, and I went over and looked at him, right? Arthur spoke up. Right. The whole left side of his hair was burned off, singed right off, you know? Mom did not seem to comprehend. She struggled for words. What, what, Eric, tell me exactly what you did. Me? Nothing. There was nothing I could do. Coach Warner, all the other coaches, they surrounded him. They started banging on his chest. Arthur added, banging on him. Doing CPR, everybody was going nuts. Dad started running up to his car phone, dialing 911. Mom said, your, your father, your father called 911. Yeah, ambulances came, cop cars came. They had this power pack thing, you know. Arthur said, jump starting him. 
they were trying to jumpstart his heart. They were sticking needles in him, everything, but nothing worked because he was already dead. He was dead before he hit the ground. What about Jack? Jack Costello, was, was he there watching all of this? No, I didn't see him. I, I think his brother was there. Eric looked over at Arthur. Was, was that his brother? Arthur said, yeah, and seemed to fight back a smile. Eric continued, his brother freaked out. He went crazy. He kept trying to take off Mike's shoes. I thought the coach was going to have to smack him. He wouldn't get out of the way. He just kept trying to get his shoes off. Did, did you see that? Eric looked at Arthur again, who covered up his face with his hand. Mom picked up the phone. She tried to reach Dad, first at his mobile number and then his office beeper, but she couldn't. I asked her, Sh should, I, should I call Joey? No, no, we can't call the Costellos now. We can't intrude on them now. Mom banged out another number on the phone. I, I'm going to try, try the school. There was no answer at the school either. Mom stood there staring at the bags of groceries. She, she looked like she was going to pass out. The ring of the telephone made her jump. It was dad calling from the hospital. He told her basically the same story Eric had right down to Joey Costello and the problem with Mike's shoes. Joey and his parents were at the hospital and Mike had officially been pronounced dead. Dad said everyone there was in a state of shock. I knew I was. I carried my bags of groceries on into the kitchen and set them down. Then I heard a strange sound. It was the sound of voices in the backyard. Happy voices. I looked through the patio doors and saw Eric and Arthur. They were laughing. I stepped closer to the doors and I could hear Eric saying, oh, did you see his hair? Did you see the side of his head? He got mohawked, man. <laughs> Arthur said mohawked. I watched them in disbelief. How could they be happy? Who were these two people? And then I realized it. They were the two people who will benefit from Mike Costello's death, and they were celebrating it. Eric grabbed at Arthur's shoes and screamed in a high-pitched voice, The shoes! Give me the shoes! I turned to look for Mom, and she was still in the garage on the phone with Dad. She saw none of this. She heard none of this. I turned back to watch the cruel comedy routine on the other side of the glass. There they were, Eric and a, and a nasty friend, just like I remembered them in Houston. Nothing had changed except the name of the friend. I felt sick and confused. I asked myself, how could this happen? How could this happen to Mike Costello? He was a nice guy. He was number two in the depth chart. He was already accepted into School of Engineering at FSU. And I answered myself, Here's how. Because Mike Costello didn't fit into the Eric Fisher football dream. Mike would never, could never have been sitting out there with Eric laughing at such a thing. But now Mike is dead, but the dream lives on. Wednesday, September 6th. Mom seemed to think they would be canceling classes at the high school today and sending everyone home early because of the tragedy with Mike Costello. Mom was way off on that one. They didn't cancel classes. They didn't even cancel football practice. I watched football practice from a distance. I stood in a goal on the soccer field looking through the back side of the soccer of the football stadium bleachers. Different pockets of players were doing different drills that all looked very violent today. Over here, they were shouting and hitting a tackling dummy. Over there, they were hurling their bodies into a blocking sled, trying to drive it backward. In the middle of all this knocking down and getting knocked down and getting back up again, I could see Eric standing at the 50-yard line, untouched by it all. Calmly, deliberately, he drilled his field goals between the upright posts in the end zone. But Mike Costello was not there to spin the laces away from the kicker and set the ball down. Mike Costello was on a slab at the Undertaker's. Nope. There was another backside in the distance today. Arthur Bowers. 
Naturally, Joey Costello was not at soccer practice or at school. I expected to hear something about Mike over the loudspeaker, but the only announcement they read about was reduced tickets to a carnival that's coming to Tangerine. No pray for Mike Costello or pray for Go Joey Costello. Mrs. Alvarez, though, wrote his address on the chalkboard and urged everyone who knows Joey to send a card to the family. A couple guys at soccer practice were talking about the accident. They said that the principal of the high school, Mr. Bridges, the husband of my language arts teacher, read an announcement. Mr. Bridges said the student council planned to do something special to honor Mike's memory. He didn't say what that something was. It obviously wasn't canceling football practice. Mom and dad are at each other's throats about all this. The football practice, the lightning, the kind of place we live in now. Mom is determined to call the parents of each and every football player, get them together, and have them refuse to send their sons to any more afternoon practices. Dad is apparently arguing the other side. Coach Warner now refers to dad as one of his football fathers. Dad likes that, and I think he is afraid of doing anything that might mess up the status. Mom's reply was something like, dead boys don't kick footballs. Soccer practice was a colossal drag. We spent most of the time playing a pointless and goalless scrimmage game. The sixth and seventh graders versus the eighth graders. I hate games like that. The ball never gets near the goal. Two teams full of clueless toe stubbers keep kicking it back and forth at each other, never going 20 yards past either side of midfield. The kid in the gray sweatshirt played goal for the eighth graders. He had a shutout going too. It's obvious to me that there are only a handful of real players on this team. Our side had Tommy and me, their side had Gino and a couple of big guys playing fullback. Everybody else who got the ball just kicked it away in a panic. We have absolutely nobody at midfield. That's why the pointless toe-stubbing battle continued to rage. There is no in-between on this team. We have two great strikers in Tommy and Gino, one great goaltender in me, and a freezer full of dog meat. Maybe when Gino and, and Tommy get together on the front line, they can feed off each other. I sure hope so. While I was standing there in the goal waiting for something to happen, my mind started to wander. I started thinking about Joey and what he must be going through. I wondered what it would be like to be in Joey's place. What if my brother had landed on the goal line with the left side of his hair singed off? What if Eric was the body at the Undertaker's now? How would I feel about that? I would feel relieved. I would feel safer too, but I would feel sorry. Eric is a part of that Eclipse story. I, I know he is. Eric is part of whatever it is that I need to remember. I don't want Eric to die and take his part of the story with him. Thursday, September 7th. Mom began her telephone campaign at 9 a.m. She had a list of all the numbers in Lake Windsor Downs, and she called everyone she knew of who had a son on the football team. After a few hours of this, she was interrupted by a call from Dad. The principal of Lake Windsor High School, Mr. Bridges, has called him. Mr. Bridges told Dad he was getting complaints from parents about the afternoon football practices. Dad and Mr. Bridges arranged to have a meeting at our house tonight with Coach Warner and anyone else who wanted to come. Mom acted surprised, hung up, then returned to her list and called back everyone who had expressed interest. She asked them all to meet at our house at 745. After dinner, I helped mom arrange couches and extra chairs in the great room. Eric went out with Arthur. For a while, I could hear them racing up and down the perimeter road in the mud, and then they were gone. By 755, 12 parents had arrived. They sat in the great room with dad and made small talk about the Japanese fish in our lake, stuff like, are the koi disappearing from the lake? Are they dying? Is someone fishing in the lake at night? Could there be an alligator eating the koi? Mom answered the door at 8.05 to Mr. Bridges, a short round man in a blue suit and Coach Warner, who was wearing a Lake Windsor High pullover. Mom showed them to a pair of chairs next to the fireplace facing the crowd. She thanked them for coming and then took a seat next to Dad on the couch. Coach Warner sat down, but Mr. Bridges remained standing to speak. 
You probably know me. I'm Bud Bridges. I'm the principal of Lake Windsor High since the doors opened here 10 years ago. And I have to share with you that this tragic accident is the worst thing that's happened to me as a principal. Mike Costello was a fine young man, a young man I'm proud to say I knew. His loss is a personal loss for me. Let's make sure he's the last one we lose. Everyone in the room looked at mom who had startled them with this interruption. Mr. Bridges recovered quickly. Amen to that. I met with the student council officers today. They have decided to dedicate this year's senior awards night to Mike Costello and plant a tree in his memory in our entranceway. Mom leaned forward. Mr. Bridges, can we count on you to stop these afternoon practices during thunderstorms? Mr. Bridges looked over at Coach Warner. I've discussed this with the coach and I'll let him address that. Mr. Bridges sat down, but Coach Warner did not get up. He spoke quietly from his chair directly at mom. Ma'am, I also took Mike Costello's death personally. I knew Mike well. I knew him as a football player and as a leader, and I know that Mike was dedicated to this team and would not want to see it destroyed because of this tragic accident. The coach cleared his throat. And that's really what you're talking about, ma'am, the destruction of this team. There really is no other time to practice, so we would be a team that did not practice. There are some boys who play for me, like Antoine Thomas, who are counting on football and on this football season in particular to get them into college. College is not just going to happen for them without football. That's a hard fact. I know some of you have the means to send your kids to college anyways. I'm just saying that not everybody is in that situation. Mom remained, hun remained hunched forward. You're not saying don't practice. We're saying don't practice when lightning might strike and kill a player. Ma'am, there has never been another boy injured by lightning in our program. We've been practicing in the same place at the same time for 10 years now. It was an accident, a tragic accident. Somebody gets killed in their car out on the highway, it's tragic and we mourn the loss of that person. We don't stop all traffic from ever using that highway again. We don't close it down. We recognize it as an accident. Mom sat upright. She pulled a small black notebook out of her pocket. Coach Warner, you may be interested in this information. This is from Tangerine Times. August 1st, Tangerine County is the lightning strike capital of the United States. More people are killed by lightning in Tangerine County last per year, excuse me, than any other county in America. That's not any other county in Florida, coach. That's any other county in America. And there have indeed been other football players killed, one at Tangerine High and one at St. Anthony's High. A cross-country runner was killed two years ago by lightning. A sophomore from Lake Windsor High was killed stepping off her school bus last year. Being struck by lightning is one of the top causes of accidental death in this area. Coach Warner looked down like he was thinking. When he looked back up at mom, he seemed to have made up his mind. Ma'am, if you choose to remove your son from the football program based on that information, I will understand. He will turn in his playbook and uniform to me or one of my assistant coaches. I looked at dad sitting back on the couch next to mom. His whole body was stiff, rigid, like he was dead. What would he do? Would he publicly take Coach Warner's side against mom? Or would he defend her and anger Eric's coach? I would not find out the answers to these questions because it was mom who spoke up. She was not ready to give up either. Mom was not ready to pull the plug on the Eric Fisher football dream that drove our lives. Why can't you hold your practices in the morning for the safety of all? I understand that these boys 
and you coaches and we parents are all dedicated. We, we can dedicate ourselves to getting the boys to football field at 630. That way they can practice for an hour, take showers and be ready for classes at eight. Coach Warner replied slowly, ma'am, I can't ask these players and their parents to give up their sleep, disrupt their lives and come out to practice football at 630. He paused to collect his thoughts. We have kids who only get to school by bus. These kids can no longer make practice again. This is about doing the right thing for everybody involved. Not all of my players have parents at home with cars who don't need to be at work themselves by 6.30 in the morning. Mom was angry now. She pointed her black notebook at him. You seem to want to make this a rich versus poor or have versus have not issue, right? But a bolt of lightning is not aware of a kid's parent's income when it hits him. That's what we're talking about here, if you'd care to listen. We're talking about kids placed in harm's way every day because of when you schedule your practice. Coach Warner looked down again. He wasn't going to budge. Mr. Bridges was looking more and more nervous. Arthur Bauer's father said to no one in particular, it's the same thing with soldiers. They got to train in all kinds of weather so they'll be ready for anything. A long, intense silence followed. It was broken when a large man, larger than Coach Warner, stood up. He had reddish, uh, a reddish-gray crew cut and a big head and neck like a football player's. When he spoke, though, it was with a surprisingly high voice. I'm Bill Donnelly. My son Terry and I live at 6200 Kew Gardens Drive. Some of you may know my house or know about it. It's the one that's been struck by lightning three times. Each time it was at about four o'clock in the afternoon. My son plays football at Lake Windsor High and I'm very proud of that, but I have to agree with Mrs. Fitz Fisher. We live in, in, an, we live in an area where this lightning strike stuff is a reality. He stopped and addressed the coach directly. I'm willing to drive my son to practice at four o'clock in the morning if I have to. And I'll take part in any kind of carpool we set up to make sure that every kid can get there. He turned and looked right at mom. I can't sell my house because of this lightning thing. I can't get an insurance agent's agent to write me a homeowner's policy. But I don't really care about any of that. I care about my son and about what might happen to him. I can't even imagine what Jack Costello and his wife are going through tonight. Mr. Donnelly sat down and the rest of the room finally came to life. Other parents leaned over to mom to tell her that they'd take part in a carpool too. Mr. Bridges stood up to speak. He had to wait until the talking died down. Well, all right, I think it's a good suggestion. We can now, what we can do now is present this suggestion to all the parents. Uh, we can contact the parent or guardian of each player and ask them to respond to the question. Should we move football practice to the early morning? Coach, does that work for you? Coach Warner was quick to agree. Of course, we can try that. Me and my staff are certainly willing. We'll ask all the parents, and if the majority want to do that, that's what we'll do. He paused to look at mom. Personally, I'd prefer another solution. Mom replied immediately, which is? Which is that we continue practice in the afternoon, but we call a halt to it whenever there is lightning in the area. That's every day, coach. Every day at four o'clock. No, it is not every day. At this time of the season, we might have rain every day. We might have rain during some of our games too, but that does not mean that there is lightning striking in the area every day. The coach stopped and no one else spoke. Mr. Bridges took the opportunity to sum up the meeting. Then we're all agreed on this course of action. We need to present this suggestion to the parents of all the players. If the majority want to move practices to the morning, we'll have to work together to solve the transportation problems that some boys might have. People from around the room started mumbling and the meeting broke up. Mom thanked Mr. Bridges and Coach Warner for coming. They exited quickly. 
Other parents lingered for a short time at the door, thanking Mom. Mom made a point of thanking Mr. Donnelly right in front of Dad for speaking up in support of our children. Dad pretended to be saying goodnight to someone else, but I'm sure he heard. By 8.30, the house was empty of guests. Mom, Dad, and I worked silently to restore the furniture and straighten up the great room. Mom headed upstairs first. She said goodnight to me, but she pointedly ignored Dad. When I went upstairs, he was standing alone by the fireplace, staring at the spot where Coach Warner had been sitting. Friday, September 8th. Our last chapter for today. I'm not going to dwell on this. I'm just going to say it and get on with my life. I was standing in the goal at soccer practice taking shots for some of the starting players, mostly eighth graders. They've all picked up on what the kid in the gray sweatshirt said about my goggles. They all call me Mars. That's okay with me. I've been called worse. What's important is that I'm a player and they all recognize that. I'm their starting goalie, right? So, I was standing in the goal, wearing the red pullover goalie shirt, handling some pretty easy shots. Gino was on the sideline talking to Coach Wolski. I saw them kind of looking at me, and then Gino came running over and yelled, Hey, Mars! Is your name Paul Fisher? Yeah? Coach wants to see you. All right. I figured this was it. This was going to make it all official. The coach was going to tell me how impressed he has been by my play and goal and so on. So I hustled over to the sideline. Coach Walski, you wanted to see me? Are you Paul Fisher? Yes, sir. He looked at his clipboard, flipped through some pages until he found a memo. Uh, Paul, you have an IEP. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Coach Walski looked pained. I'm sorry to tell you this, Paul, but you're not eligible for the program. Sir, you can't play. You can't play soccer for Lake Windsor Middle School. What are, you, what are you talking about can't play? I'm one of the best players here. No. No, I mean, you're not eligible to play. I have a memo from Mr. Murrow saying you're in a special program for the visually handicapped. Is that right? So what? I can see fine. That's not the point. I don't understand what you're talking about. We have to carry insurance on every boy and girl in the program and, or we can't play, period. If we lose our insurance, we lose our program. I'm sorry, but there's no way we can justify putting a visually handicapped student in the goal of all places where he could get his head kicked in. He looked at me like I was crazy to think otherwise and then he added, come on now. I screamed, no, you come on now. You see if you can kick my head and you see if you or anybody else here can get one ball past me. One ball. Coach Walski pulled back. He changed his tone. Paul, I'm sorry. I know you're upset. I know you're disappointed, but try to understand this. It'd be the same situation if you had a heart murmur or hernia or whatever. I have to play it straight with the insurance company. If any kid has any physical problem, I have to report it. And I know that this condition of yours will not be acceptable to the insurance company. Again, I'm sorry. He got even sorrier a few seconds later. I still can't believe what I did. I knelt down on that sideline, took off my sports goggles, and started to cry. I didn't say another word. I just put my head down and cried and sobbed. Coach Welski was as much at a loss as I was. Neither of us knew what to do next. He just stood there and watched me. I heard him call an assistant over and tell him to organize the scrimmage. Coach Wolski stood a little off to the side and waited. I finally stopped, wiped my face with my goalie shirt, put my goggles back on, and walked from the field to the parking lot. I stood in the bus shelter until five when mom pulled up in the station wagon. Dad was right behind her in the range world rover. Mom rolled down the passenger side window. What, what are you doing here? Are you all right? I got kicked off the team. What? What happened? Coach Walski said I'm in a program for the handicapped, so I'm off the team. That's, that's outrageous. He, he can't do that. Well, he just did it. 
He said they can't get insurance for me because I'm in a handicapped program. You know all about that, right, Mom? Me? What do you mean? He told them I'm handicapped. He told them I'm visually impaired. Well, darling, you are. I just told them the truth. That's not the truth. I can see. Don't you know that? Why did you fill out that stupid form when you know I can see? You saw me play in Houston. You saw me make 30 saves in one game. Did I look visually impaired then? Paul, darling. I did not know the IEP form had anything to do with playing on the soccer team. I would never have filled it out if it did. I know how important this is to you. Listen now. Your father will straighten this up with Coach Welski. She turned off her engine, got out, and went back to speak with Dad. I didn't listen, but I guess she explained the situation because Dad got out and walked to the soccer field. I remained standing in the bus shelter, watching the black outline of an osprey slowly crossing the sky to its nest. It was clutching something that flashed brightly, reflecting in the sun. I said to myself, there goes another one of your koi, Mr. Costello. Mom was watching me, but she didn't say anything. Did she really believe that Dad was going to straighten this out? We both watched Dad talk to Coach Welski, and we both watched him walk back to the station wagon. He looked at the passenger window between Mom and me and said, All right, here's the deal. They have a problem with the insurance. They can't put Paul in goal because of his vision. However, Coach Wolski does want you to manage the team. He hasn't appointed a manager yet this season, and he wants you to take the job. He said to tell you that you'd be on the bus. You'd be in charge of the team and the equipment for every game, home and away. I looked at Mom's face. At least she understood. At least she had a clue. I didn't argue. There was nothing left to say. I looked back at Dad and said to him calmly, I'm not a water boy, Dad. I'm not a team manager. I'm a player. Then I climbed into the back of the station wagon and we all started for home. After a few miles, Mom whispered, Darling, do you want me to go speak to Mr. Murrow? I said, What for? To tell him that your vision has improved? Why? Do you believe that? We drove in silence for a while and then she answered, Yes. Yes, I do believe it. And I do remember those games in Houston. You were the best goaltender in that league. I was terrified to let you play, but you turned out to be the best goaltender in that league. I looked up at the rear view mirror and saw tears in her eyes. Paul, all I can do is apologize and promise that I'll never mention your eyesight to anyone ever again. I was too hurt and angry to tell her that I appreciated those words that those words helped, but they did. And that's the end for today.